I want to bring you a message tonight entitled The Christian's Contingency Plan. The Christian's Contingency Plan. Now, you're familiar with Ephesians 6, but let's begin reading tonight, if you will, in verse 10. Ephesians 6 and verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now let me call your attention to two verses. Verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Circle in your Bible, or at least make a note in your mind about that phrase, the evil day. Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Now watch this phrase. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. The Christian's contingency plan. Bow with me in prayer, if you will. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for the fact that we're saved, that Jesus is our Savior. We're thankful that we do not walk the pathway of life alone. How miserable it would be to try to face Satan alone. How miserable it would be to face the evil men of this day alone. How awful it would be to have to stand in the evil day and stand there alone. Aloneness. Loneliness is an awful thing. But, Father, we're saved, and your presence is always with us. And, Father, you've told us to watch. We live in an evil world. You have warned us of the evil day. Now, Father, we need your mind and your help. May we not be flippant about these moments together. May we have your Spirit's touch upon our hand and upon our lives. And may we listen to what you have to say to us. This prayer we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. When we went to New York to candidate for the church there at Palmyra Bible Baptist, we had some days and we took the long way around. We went into uh, New York City and then we went up to uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame and then on over to Palmyra, which is down below Rochester. I noticed something in all those little towns and villages in New York, something that I had not noticed uh, down south at all. And it was a sign on all of the streets that said, Snow Route. Now, you don't see that down south. But in every little town, in every little hamlet, big signs that said the Snow Route. Now, I did not pay any attention to them. I just didn't pay any attention to them until October came. <laughs> and the snow came, and I discovered it's a whole new ball game up north. You don't park your car out on the street. You've got to make sure it's in your garage, off the street. Uh, you better be ready to snow, uh, shovel snow of a morning if you want to go to work and if you want to go to school. And then I discovered that little sign that said snow route was real important because when it snowed, that was the only road that was clear. They didn't care anything about anything else but that one road, it was clear and you could go from place to place. What were they doing? They had a contingency plan. They had a plan in place so that when it snowed, people could get to where they were going. They could go to school, they could go to work, 
they could go to the grocery store, they had planned ahead for the inevitable. Now, I was born and raised in Dayton, Tennessee, in Ray County. And for many, many years, things looked pretty much the same until they built the Watch Bar nuclear plant. And then, on Highway 27, and in different areas, you'd see a great big sign that said evacuation route. And what that was simply was if there was a major disaster at that nuclear plant, this was the road that you were to take to get out of there so you could save yourself and your family from national disaster or from a local disaster. So what they were saying was, we are being prepared for what may come. Uh, Mayor Riley uh, warns us uh, in a commercial, if you want to call it that from time to time, about what this city should do if there's another hurricane, if there's another Hugo. If there's something like that happens, there is a plan in place so that we will be ready and we'll be able to face whatever comes our way. Now let me ask you a question tonight. Do you have a plan for the evil day? Paul said in this passage of Scripture, you better be ready to stand because the evil day is coming. Then he said in verse 18, persevere, watch, be ready. You know what he's talking about? You know what he's saying? There will come into your life storm. It's coming. There's no way that you can get around it. Every man, every woman, every young person in this building tonight, if God allows us to live any time upon this earth, we will find coming into our life the evil day. Now, here's the problem with most of us. Most of us just go day to day with no plan, with no thought to what we're going to do if something awful and terrible comes into our life. What would you do tomorrow if you were faced with a financial disaster that you were not expecting? I want to remind you of something. Those of you that are sort of set financially. Oh, you're not rich, but yet you, you can make it. There's money in the bank. You've got a lot of things paid for. Can I say this to you? Be very careful of looking down your nose at people that don't have anything. Be very careful of looking down your nose at people that are struggling. Young couples just starting out uh, in marriage that are struggling. You struggle once, possibly, unless you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth. And sometimes it's real easy to be hard on people because we're sort of set and we don't have to worry about it. And we get uh, sort of discouraged sometimes and upset at those that are struggling along. And we'll sometimes just sort of throw them aside and say, well, if they'd planned better, if they'd been better organized, if, they, if they'd have done this and done that. Let me remind you of something. God might bring you down. You might come to a place of financial reversal. But it might not be a financial reversal. God might bring some sickness into your life. There could be someone that you love God might take away to remind you of how frail you are and to remind you and to remind me that as we go through life, we need to keep a tender heart because in every life, some rain's going to fall and there will come the financial reverses and there will come the physical reverses. There will come the physical maladies uh, in our life. Are you prepared for that? Are you ready for that? Jesus said something to Peter one day that made him wake up. You remember what he said? Simon, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith will not fail. What if you knew that tomorrow Satan would throw everything that he has at you? that he was bent on destroying you, that you would go no further. Do you have a plan in place? Do you know what you would do? Do you know what, 
how you would handle the situation? Are you ready? Are you able to stand when the evil day comes? I mentioned Job this morning. God said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There's nobody like him. And the devil said to you, Oh, yeah. He serves you because you build a hedge around him. And God said, Okay, I'll take the hedge away. And Job still stayed faithful to God. Then the devil said, Well, yeah, take away what a man has, but touch his body and he'll curse you to the face. God said, all right, go ahead and do that. But you can't touch his soul. You can't touch his spirit. And of course, you know the story. After it was all over, and even his wife said, curse God and die, the Bible says that Job retained his integrity. Why? Because he had a plan. He had a contingency plan. He knew that there was a good God. And nothing could happen to him without God allowed it to happen. And he knew what to do. He knew what he was going to do when something came into his life. But again, I ask you that question tonight, and I want to be reminded of that. Am I ready for the evil day? Now let's just pause for a second. I was talking to a young man this week, a young, strong young man this week, a very talented a very brilliant young man this week. You know what he said to me? He said, he wanted to talk to me. He said, Preacher, this week I blew it. And he said, I blew it good. He said, usually I'm in control. Usually things and people don't get to me and I try to be a good witness where I work. But he said, somebody did something to me this week, and he said, I absolutely blew up. And he said, I know I've lost my testimony with some people. I've hurt my family. I've hurt the Lord. He said, I'm hurting myself. He said, I've blown it. Now, what should I do? Can I say tonight that all of us are going to blow it from time to time? We are human. Now, by the way, when others blow it, be as kind and gentle to them as you would like for them to be with you when you blow it. Don't be so hard and so calloused and don't get the idea that you've arrived and that you've come to a place where you're not going to fall and you're not going to mess up. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And so the young man said, I, I've blown it. I, I just, I've blown it. He said, what should I do? I said to him, let me give you three things to remember when you blow it. And let me give this to you before we look at our contingency plan for the child of God. And we'll, we'll go quickly tonight. We'll not keep you a long time. But what I have to say tonight out of the Word of God, I believe, is important. When you failed in the evil day, when you've blown it, when you know that you have, what should you do? Number one, well, ask yourself three questions. Just look at three different things. Number one, what happened? What happened? Describe the problem. Well, let's say I got angry. I got angry. And I used anger in an improper manner. And I said some things in that anger, and I blew up in that anger and my facial expressions and what I did and what I said was not wrong was not right it was wrong so you look at what happened and you say this is it I blew it this is what I did I'm ashamed of it but I did it I'm willing to admit it now here's where the battle is going to come in most of us are not willing to say hey I did I did wrong we're too proud we're too selfish. We don't want somebody to look down on us. And we're not willing to look back at that event and say, this is what I did, and it was wrong. But if you're going to move on, you've got to look back at what happened and admit, I, I sinned, I was wrong, I was angry. Let that help you to be a springboard. So you look back at what happened. Number two, you ask yourself this question. What should I have done? What does the Bible say? What should I have done? How do I handle that situation? Let's stay with the matter of anger. 
Here's what the Bible says about anger. Be ye angry and sin not. So there are some things that you can get angry about. You get angry at the sin that's going on in our country. You get angry at the people that do evil things. You, you, you get angry at what's happening and going on. But you don't get angry at the person. You love the person. You speak the truth in love. It's okay to get angry just so it's not sinful anger. What did I do? But what should I have done? And I said to this young man, I said, what you got angry at was right. He described the situation. I said, what you were angry at was right, but the way you handled it was wrong. Be you angry and sin not. What does the Bible say about it? What should I have done? And then thirdly, the third question you ask yourself is this. What must I do now? What must I do now? What should I do to rectify the problem? And if it's a matter of anger, and if it's like this young man's case, you go to that individual and you say, Hey, look, I blew it. Speak the truth in love. Now, I believe that what you did was wrong, but how I reacted to you was wrong. And I'm a Christian, and I know that I've lost some ground with you, but I'm going to do what's right. Will you forgive me for my response and the way that I responded? And then you go to God and you say, Lord, I failed. Will you forgive me? Will you help me to handle anger properly in the future? And at every time that you blow it in your Christian life, if you'll keep those three things in mind, what was it that I did? Look at the situation. Analyze the situation. Admit what you did was wrong. Then look at the way you should have handled it from a biblical perspective. What does the Bible have to say about this thing that I've done? And now what must I do now if I've got to repay somebody if I've stolen something, then I repay him. Remember back in the Old Testament time when someone stole something? They had to pay not just what he did, but several times over for what they did. If we'd do that today, we'd have a lot less thieves. Amen? When does a man quit becoming a thief? When he quits stealing? When he, no, when he's not stealing at all. And that'd be a good thing, wouldn't it? But here are times that we're going to blow it, but we use those as stepping stones rather than stumbling blocks to help us. Now, a Christian contingency plan to prepare ourselves for the evil day. What is the plan? Put down several things real quickly, and I'm not going to keep you a long time, but put them down. Number one, recognize the danger signals. What is your plan? Number one, recognize the danger signals. Now, the Bible says that we really don't know our heart. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I hear somebody make a statement, if I know my heart. Well, really, we don't. But I know someone that does. God does. He knows my heart. The Holy Spirit knows my heart. And so here's, here's what I do. I go to the Lord and I say, Father, I want to be my best for you. I want to be effective witness. I want to be a powerful witness so, Lord, help me to recognize my weaknesses and help me to recognize the things that will lead me astray, the things that I battle with. Now, you see, that brings it down on a personal level, on a personal note. There are some things that would not bother me at all that I don't have any problems with that might bother you greatly and vice versa. We're individuals. And can I say this? Satan knows you well. Satan knows me well. As a matter of fact, if you'll study the Word of God very carefully, I think that Satan has us observed through demonic activity 24 hours a day. I believe Satan has had us observed all the days that we're up on this earth. And Satan pretty much knows how to tempt us, in what direction to come. He knows where our weaknesses lie. And remember something that Satan and his host 
are well organized. Individually, we are no match for the devil. But when we face him with the armor that God has given us, as mentioned here in Ephesians chapter 6, remember that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And the first thing that you and I are to do is that we're to recognize the danger signals. Now, avoid, watch this now, avoid putting yourself in the path of sin. Turn to a very familiar passage of Scripture, Psalms chapter 1. Psalms chapter 1. Have a plan in place. Recognize the danger signals. Avoid putting yourself in the path of sin. Now look at Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor setteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doeth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall, shall prosper. Here is the psalmist. He realizes that sin is out there. He realizes that Satan is after him continually. He realizes that within his own self, there's nothing he can do. But look at what he says in verse 1. Blessed, and the word blessed means happy, approved in the sight of God, is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor setteth in the seat of the scornful. You know what he's doing? He's saying, stay away. Stay away. Avoid the path of sin. Don't associate with those that will lead you away. Don't associate with those that are evil and vile and wicked. You associate yourself with godly people, with godly men and women that will love you and that will care for you. Stay away from the path of sin. Then number two, flee from all evil. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 22. Flee youthful lust. Run away from. Don't get near anything that can take hold upon your life. And then number three, avoid stumbling blocks that start you down the path to sin. Avoid the stumbling blocks that start you down on the path of sin. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 7. If it's a magazine, stay away from it. If it's a bottle of wine, stay away from it. Whatever it is that will lead you further and further away from God and the things of God, stay away from it. Recognize the danger signals. Number two, ask God for help immediately. Ask God for help immediately. I realize my weakness. And I realize, listen carefully, I realize how when you and I fail to stay away from danger areas, how quickly you can slide down after you take that first step. Just take that first step. Just go ahead and entertain that thought in your mind. Now, Martin Luther said, and it's comical in a way, but it's so true. Martin Luther said, I can't keep a bird from flying over my head but I can sure keep him from building a nest in my hair. Amen? Now, that's good advice. I can't keep from being confronted with temptation, but I don't have to continue thinking and entertain those thoughts. I might be, a, be in a vulnerable position where here and there and there and there are dangerous, sinful places but the thing I need to do is not take that step in that direction or say that word. And sometimes that's where we get ourselves in a real mess when we say things so quickly and we don't guard what we say. Turn to, he uh, to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Here's a passage of Scripture that you ought to memorize, that I ought to have memorized, and keep it before us all times. Hebrews chapter 4. Look at verse 15 and 16. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. This matter of prayer, this matter of staying before God is so important. Verse 15 and verse 16. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, 
but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Did you see that phrase? Time of need. What did Paul say in Ephesians? The evil day. The evil day. The evil day is coming. So what do you do? You go to God immediately in prayer. Now look at verse 15. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched. The word touch there means to feel sympathy. Now, the legalist churches and legalist church members and preachers, when you blow it, they'll cut you off just like that. They have no sympathy for you. They'll not forgive you. They're not willing to admit. They're very hard on people. Aren't you glad our God is not like that? Amen. Aren't you glad our Savior is not like that? I'm glad that He understands how we feel. He understands that we're just grass. He understands that our flesh is just like grass, the weakness of, of what we are and who we are. He understands that. Why? Because the Bible says, and I can't explain this. Maybe when heaven, we get to heaven, this will be explained to us. I can't explain it. Here is God in flesh. And literally, we are told in the Bible that there was nothing in Jesus that sin could take hold of. There was nothing in Jesus that Satan could take hold of. He's God. But then on the other hand, here is man. He's God, but he's man. Everything that I have felt, he felt. Every temptation that I've ever faced, he faced it. Yet he didn't sin, but he faced it. He felt it. He knew the pull. So therefore, I have a high priest that knows how I feel and is sympathetic toward me. Now you tell that to a legalistic preacher, he'll laugh in your face. You tell that to a legalistic Christian, there's no sympathy there. But he better be careful because he may stumble also. You see? And so he says, I know how you feel. I have sympathy for you. Now read on. He cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities or literally our weaknesses. But in all points was tempted. That is, he was tried just like we are. And because he has sympathy for us, look at verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly, and the word boldly there is freely. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain. The word obtain is take hold of. Now watch this and don't miss it. <coughs> when you are confronted with temptation, when the evil day comes, you have someone that's greater than you are in heaven that never failed, that never sinned, that knows how you, face, how you feel. And when you go to him, you can take hold of the power to give you the victory. And you don't have to fail. And you don't have to sin. And you don't have to be knocked down and succumb, be succumbed to Satan's temptations. Go to God immediately in prayer and ask him to help you. Look at James chapter 1. The book of James chapter 1. Look at verses 5 through verse 8. James chapter 1, verses 5 through verse 8. If any of you lack wisdom... Now, let's stop right there for a second. Now, look, look at me for just a second. If any of you lack wisdom... The word wisdom there means looking at life from God's point of view. Wisdom. Looking at life from God's point of view. Now, young people... If you try to live life and look at life from the world's point of view, Hollywood's point of view, you know what you'll get? Just what the world can offer you that'll only last for a short time. But you look at life from God's point of view, and you know what you'll have? You'll have what God can give you that'll last forever. And I would much rather have God's wisdom. So he says, if you lack wisdom, that is, what you need to do is to look at life from God's point of view. Now read on. Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. 
But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, or literally double-souled. An unstable man is double-souled. He never knows what he wants. At one moment, he wants to live for God. At the next moment, he wants to live like the world. At one moment, he's praising God. At the next time, he's in the depths of despair. He's double-souled. He doesn't know what he wants. What does that man need? Wisdom. To look at life from God's point of view. And what does God say here? Ask me for it. If you lack wisdom, then ask of God. And if you're, if you're serious about it, he'll give it to you and give it to you liberally. And the word liberally simply means God won't withhold anything. He'll give you everything that you need. Number three, <clears throat> put down, we're talking about a contingency plan for Christians. Number three, generate movement now. In other words, do something positive biblically now. Don't wait and say, well, you know what I'll do? I've been tempted, I've been tested. So what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and sin now. I'll enjoy it now, and then I'll ask God to forgive me, and then the next time I'll be holy. Next time I'll live righteously. You better be careful with that kind of talk. Because it doesn't take but one sin. It doesn't take one real mess up, one slip up, that you might not recover from. And a classic example of that is David. It is the time that kings go forth to war. He should have been out on the battlefield. But instead of in the battlefield, he was at a time of leisure in his life. And when he walked up on the roof and looked and saw Bathsheba, you know what the first thing he should have done was? Turn around and leave. But he didn't do it. Now you listen to me. <clears throat> And one thing led to another. And the Bible said that this was something that David never got away from for the rest of his life. The sword never left David's house. So we shouldn't be flippant with sin. Young people, don't you be flippant with sin. When you're faced with temptations, when you're faced with the matter of sinning and the, and the difficulties of life, uh, do something right away. What are you to do? You're to go into, a, into the, a biblical direction right away. You're to know what to do biblically and handle it from a spiritual standpoint. Turn to Isaiah chapter 55 and look at verse 8 and 9. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9. I want to remind you of something tonight. We're dealing with a great God who has all the answers. Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We're dealing with a great God who has the answer to every problem that I have, and if I will trust him, if I'll live for him, if I'll begin to develop a biblical pattern in my life, a biblical lifestyle, you know what God will do for me? He'll do the amazing and the wonderful. Number four, a Christian contingency plan. What do you do? You recall, you recall scriptures that you have memorized. Matthew chapter four. We don't have time to go into it tonight. But every time Satan came to Jesus with a temptation, what did Jesus say? It is written, it is written, it is written. Now, if you're tested in some area, you don't just quote any scripture. John 3.16 doesn't work every time for your particular temptation. Jesus quoted the word of God as it was in proportion to the sin that he was tempted with. You know why most of us fail miserably? Is because we do not know the book. Some trial comes into our life, we have no way of handling it. 
because we've not memorized enough scripture, we've not studied the word of God, that we don't know what to do. We're just like a little babe out in the woods. But a strong Christian who wants to do something for the glory of God, he'll memorize this book. He'll commit the word of God to memory. And when Satan comes to him, he'll say, oh no, the Bible says, that this is wrong, and the Bible says this is what I am to do, and I'm going to follow what the Bible says. And God will do for you some amazing, some amazing things. Now, why do you, why do you go back to the scriptures that you've memorized? Simply because action begins in the mind. That's why the Bible talks over and over again about the renewing of the mind, the renewing of the mind. And you can't hold two thoughts in your mind at the same time. And so when the testing comes, go immediately to the Word of God. Number five, put down if you will, seek help of believers if necessary. There's a godly man or a godly woman somewhere that loves you and cares for you. They're stronger than you are. They more, know more of the Word of God than you are. They've been further down the road than you have. They have great compassion. They have great wisdom. They have great understanding. Go to them and talk to them. Open up your heart to them and let them help you. Let them be there for you. Now, here's a verse you know, but turn to it. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. <clears throat> I feel we need to turn to it again tonight and look at it because I have something I want to point out to you. Ephesians, or Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault. Now underscore the word overtaken. Listen now. There is not as much danger to the Christian who is overtaken in a fault as there is to the Christian who knows what he's doing doing it willingly and not repenting of it. There's great danger. Let's say tonight some of you young people, you have some things hidden in your room mom and dad didn't know about. You've been saying some things that no one else knows about and you know it and you're doing it and you don't plan to stop, you plan to investigate a little bit more. You're in real danger. You are in real danger. You're in danger if you're a Christian of God chastening you. You're in danger of losing your testimony, your effectiveness. You're in danger of losing a lifetime of opportunity. So if you're doing something and you're dabbling in something and you're experimenting with something and it's dangerous and it's sinful, but you're going to have this idea, I'm going to do it anyway, there's great danger there. Get away from it. Get rid of it as quickly as possible. Drugs, tobacco, alcohol, magazine, whatever it may be, get away from it. But he says here, if a man be overtaken, I don't like it. I don't want to do it. I want victory, but I fail. Now, that's a little different. And so he says, if you're overtaken in a fault, watch now, ye which are spiritual, restore such in one, in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now, you Bible scholars here tonight, you already know that that word restore means the setting of a bone. Now, I've never had a broken leg or arm. But I do know that in order to have a bone set, if it's broken, it hurts when you have it set. They tell. Now, <clears throat> I have had surgery on my knee. I did blow my knee out. And I went to the, a doctor, and I was hoping that it, we didn't have to have surgery. I was hoping that it was just sprained. No. He said, he got that thing up there and started twisting it around, and he said, no, we're going to have to have surgery. Now, I don't like people cutting on me, 
and you don't either. But then he said, there's fluid on the knee, and I'm going to have to get that fluid off of the knee. Now, when he stuck that big old long needle down in my knee, I said, ouch. <laughs> I said, oh! <laughs> Louder than that. <laughs> it hurt, and it hurt like the dickens. And you know what he told me? He said, now, preacher, I know that hurt, but if I'm going to get your knee right, I had to do it. Now, if you're going to have a bone, it's going to be set properly, it's going to hurt. Sometimes admitting that we've got a problem hurts. And sometimes we can't do it on our own. We've got to go to somebody that will help us. And so if you're fighting tonight with a problem, and this describes you, you may have to go to a loving believer, a loving Christian that's going to help you. Now, make sure you go to the right kind of Christian. Don't go to a legalist. You don't go to a Christian that has the love of God in him. And what will he do? He'll help you to set that bone. Put down number six, and lastly, start doing the loving and responsible thing regardless of your feelings. Start doing the loving and responsible thing regardless of your feelings. Now, the devil loves to get into your emotions. Well, this is not a big thing. I think I can handle this. Well, you know, I know I'm having a problem with this, but nobody else knows it. The devil will get into your feelings. He'll start working on your emotions. But listen to me tonight. Listen. Do the responsible thing regardless of how you feel. One more verse tonight. John chapter 14, verse 15. John chapter 14 and verse 15. Look at what Jesus said here. John chapter 14 and verse 15. If you love me, watch, keep my commandments. Look at verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. You know what Jesus is saying? You know what's right? Do it. You know what my commandments are? Now obey them. Now let me say this in closing tonight. <clears throat> when you do what is right, now listen carefully. When you do what is right, the proper and appropriate emotions will flow from doing what's right. We get it backwards. I want to have some emotion first. I want to feel something first, then I'll get right. That's not the way it works. You do what is right, and then the proper emotions will come. Now remember this. Satan always does everything backward from God. Listen, young people. What the devil will do is he saves the worst for the last. He starts out with the very best and ends, you end up with the worst. Here's what the devil says. Follow me, live for me, and I'll give you fame, fortune, You'll enjoy this, you'll like that, you'll have pleasure, and listen to me, that's true. For what? There's pleasure in sin for a season. So the devil gives you the best first, but then sin ties its cord around you, and things get worse and worse and worse and worse, and then you end up in hell. He saves the worst for the last. God does just the opposite. God gives you the hard thing first. See yourself a sinner. See how wicked you are. Repent of your wickedness. 
trust in me. You get that taken care of first. And then the Bible says that the Christian life goes brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter until we end up in heaven. God saves the best for last. Isn't that great? God starts out with the hard, and you end up with the best. Satan starts with the best he can offer, and it ends up with the worst. He end up in hell. <laughs> I'm no prophet, so I can't prophesy what's going to happen tomorrow to anybody. I look out over our auditorium in the night, and I see seniors that are up in years. I see middle-aged folk. I see young people. I cannot prophesy what will come into your life tomorrow. I don't know. But I can project this. There will be some difficult days. I can say that. I know my Bible. I know life well enough to know there will be some difficult, hard days. Are you prepared? That's all I'm saying. Do you have a plan in place that when this day comes, you'll be able to stand? Or will you be bowled over? and be defeated. Would you stand with heads bowed and eyes closed? Brother Lindsay's going to come and we're going to have an, an invitation hymn. Every head is bowed. Christian